So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today is part three of the case that we've been covering that goes by like 10 different names. The Singing Strangler, the Smiling Strangler, the Brownout Murders, the Brownout Serial Killer, the Of Mice and Men Killer. So if you haven't caught parts one and two, you kind of need to watch them before you watch this one, otherwise it won't make much sense. I'll leave them up here in the eye if you want to go and watch them and then come back here when you're all caught up and we can do it together. But before we get into it, I just want to thank our sponsor for making this video possible, NordVPN. NordVPN is a virtual private network service that I have used for years to to keep myself and all of my information safe while I'm using the internet. It works by making it appear as though you're operating from a different IP address than you actually are. And this kind of puts a barrier between you and all of your precious information and people out there that might be trying to hack you or access your information. It's especially useful if you use public Wi-Fi a lot, like cafes or libraries, restaurants. I literally researched some of this case on the train as I was coming back to London on their free Wi-Fi. And of course I had a VPN enabled. Cause you never know how secure those networks are. So I always think it's better to be safe. Please be safe with public Wi-Fi. You can choose where in the world you want this new IP address to be from. NordVPN have so many countries to choose from and this comes with a bunch of other benefits as well. So you can access the internet as though you're from the country that you choose. So I choose America all the time because I love their Netflix selection. They have such a better selection than we have. But like a lot of YouTubers get their videos blocked in different countries. So if your favorite YouTuber has some videos blocked, you can use a VPN to get around that. I know a lot of my videos are blocked in the UK. And NordVPN are very kindly offering you guys a huge discount off of a two year plan plus a bonus gift when you sign up using my link, which is nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor and use the code Eleanor at checkout. You can use the link down below in the description if that's easier for you. Thanks again NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Now before we get into part three of this case I do just want to give the same content warnings that I've been given the whole time. This case does involve themes of sexual assault, rape, domestic abuse, child abuse, alcoholism. It is a really heavy one so if you don't want to watch this right now I totally understand. Click out, look after yourself. I'm sure I'll see you again another time with a case that's a little bit more suitable for you. So I'm just going to give a quick summary of what's happened in the case so far and then we'll just flow straight into the rest of it. It's the middle of World War II in Melbourne, Australia in May 1942 and three women have been murdered in the middle of the brownouts and police have finally arrested who they believe to be their serial killer. And this is where we left part two. 24 year old Eddie Leonsky has just committed his first ever murder and it's left him hungry for more. Six days later, Eddie went out to another bar where he saw a woman sitting all alone at a table for two. And that woman was Pauline Thompson. I think I said in part one that her friends believed that she was on a date with a guy that she knew and that she'd met before. She'd been on three dates with this guy before but her friends were wrong. Pauline was sat at this table waiting for that date that her friends thought she was gonna meet, but it appeared that Pauline Thompson had been stood up by this date. He wasn't turning up. She realized that he wasn't coming. She realized that she'd been stood up. And so her plan was just to finish her drink and then leave. But then something happened. Eddie Leonsky approached Pauline Thompson at her table and he already knew. He already knew what the situation was. A woman sat alone at a table for a long period of time. She seemed quite sad. He asked if she was okay, but he knew what the situation was. He walked over and asked, you've been stood up, haven't you? And Pauline replied, seems that way. So Eddie sat down opposite her and tried to comfort her a little bit. He told her that she was beautiful and he said, come out with me. Let's do a night together. I'll make you forget about the man that stood you up. We'll, we'll make your night worthwhile. So he went over to the bar. He ordered two gin and oranges, took them back over to Pauline and the two of them talked and talked and talked and talked. And this must have been when Pauline's friends turned round. They saw Pauline sitting with an American soldier and they must have just thought that this was her date. I mean, they'd never met her date before. They didn't know his name. So of course they thought Eddie Leonsky was her date. And so they didn't walk over. They didn't interrupt because they trusted this guy that Pauline had been out with three times already. 
Little did they know that this man sitting with her was a complete stranger. After a while, Pauline and Eddie got up and left the bar and her friends thought, oh, okay, okay. But they were just making their way to another bar. They got up and they walked in the pouring down rain to the next place. When they arrived, they stayed for about another hour at this next bar and they polished off six more gin and oranges between the two of them. And they're getting to know each other, the conversation's flowing. And it was at this point that Pauline Thompson and mentioned to Eddie Leonsky that she was a singer. And as I'm sure you can imagine, this set something on fire inside this man. So he asked Pauline to sing for him and she did. And he was just amazed. Pauline really had a beautiful voice. She would sing in bars on a nighttime. She was one of those performer women that Eddie always loved to go and see, but he'd never been to see Pauline before. So anyway, they carried on their night. They carried on talking as normal. And then when that bar came to closing time, Eddie offered to walk Pauline Thompson home. She accepted and so so the two of them walked and they talked for a while, but Eddie just could not stop thinking about this woman's singing voice. And so he asked her to sing for him again, and she did. She sang for him all the way home. Pauline Thompson was actually staying at a boarding house that night rather than her house because her and her friends had gone out actually quite far from where they lived. So she had a room at this boarding house and they approached the stairs that led up to it. Pauline and Eddie stood outside on the concrete stairs of this boarding house for a while and they were talking, they shared a cigarette and then Pauline leaned in to kiss Eddie. And this triggered something inside him. He probably knew that this was coming. He probably knew that he was gonna do this at some point tonight. But now that she was standing in front of him, Eddie Leonsky just knew it was time to kill her. So he wrapped his hands around her neck and squeezed as tightly as he possibly could. And Pauline started fighting back pretty well as well. Eddie had a challenge with this one. But as we know, Leonsky was a very big, muscly, strong man. And of course he ended up overpowering Pauline. His hands didn't slip once. And within a matter of minutes, he choked Pauline Thompson to death. Her body gave way in his hands and he just dropped her to the ground where he then decided to go on and stage her body just as he'd done with Ivy. I think he left Pauline pretty much the exact same way that he'd left Ivy with her breasts exposed and her legs pulled up and apart. This time though, Eddie didn't stick around. He stayed with Ivy McLeod's body for about 30, 40 minutes after he killed her. But this time it was in way too much of an open area on just like an open concrete staircase. Eddie was out. He grabbed Pauline's bag and ran. Now, a lot of people don't believe that he was stealing Pauline's bag to steal, if that makes sense. He wasn't doing this for a money motive. He was doing it because she had a soft bag and he thought it was comforting and nice. And this is actually where he gets the name the Of Mice and Men Killer. And of course, the fact that he's really into women's high-pitched soft voices. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but he really liked how soft this bag was and he wanted it. But he realized how bait it would have been to take this bag. Obviously, police are gonna be looking for it. And so instead, he decided to just open it, took the cash out and then threw the bag in an alleyway somewhere. But even then, he didn't even take a lot of cash. He took just enough for his taxi ride back to the camp. And when he returned home, Eddie Leonsky was still drunk off his face. And that was when he stumbled into his best friend at camp. This guy's name was Private Anthony Gallo. The two of them had been friends for a while now. Eddie had been kind of like a big brother to Anthony Gallo because when Gallo first joined the army, he was picked on quite a lot. And Eddie being the big wham guy that he was, he protected Gallo and like told all the men off <laughs> for bullying. Him. Gallo used to be a target for robberies and, and all this bullying and stuff and Eddie kind of saved him and saved his reputation and now no one picked on Gallo because he was Eddie Leonsky's friend. So anyway, Leonsky bumps into Gallo when he gets back into the camp and Gallo remembers Eddie having this really concerned, kind of scared look on his face. Gallo tried not to say anything to him because he didn't really know what was going on and at one point Eddie just turned to him and blurted out, I killed Gallo, I killed. But Gallo didn't really take it too 
Seriously. I mean, Eddie was drunk all the time. He said shit all the time. Like, you never really know what to trust with him. Not that he lies a lot, but he's just always very, very drunk. And drunk people say a lot of things. So Gallo just sent Eddie off to bed and dismissed the whole thing. But he shouldn't have. As time went by, Gallo kept thinking about this interaction and thinking, what if Eddie was telling the truth? After all, Eddie was a very aggressive man when he drinks. He was always challenging people to wrestling and boxing matches and sometimes even like actual fights. He would get into actual fights. And Gallo was thinking, could Eddie Leonski be capable of this? Like, could it have got to this? Could he have actually killed someone? A few days later, Gallo walked into Eddie's bunk to see him flicking through a newspaper on his bed looking specifically for information about Pauline Thompson, his last murder victim. And now Gallo was starting to believe him. Eddie showed Gallo this article and said, it was me, that was me. He told Gallo everything about how they met, how they walked home together, her bag, how he stole her bag. It was clear that the guilt was starting to eat away at Eddie when he was sober. I think him telling Gallo this, him confiding in Gallo, is him trying to get this off his chest because he would commit these murders when he was very, very drunk and then he would wake up the next day and he would be a mess. So Gallo was taken back a bit and he was saying to Eddie like, look, you need to go see a priest. You need to like confess these sins or something. You need to get this off of your chest. And Eddie was like, no, no, I don't need to do that. And Gallo said to him, well, why don't you just give yourself up to the police then? Like, just do it, just go tell them. If it's eating away at you this bad, then like maybe you could even get away with an insanity plea and then you wouldn't even have to go to prison. And Eddie stopped for a while thinking that actually that's quite a good idea. Gets it off his chest, he doesn't get any prison time, he wouldn't have the consequences of his actions once again trend with Eddie Leonski. He thought it could be a good idea, but ultimately the conversation changed topic and nothing ever came of it. He never ended up going to the police about himself. Later on, Eddie started telling Anthony Gallo the story about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. If you're unfamiliar with that concept, if someone has a Jekyll and Hyde personality, it means there's two completely different sides to them. They've got like their good side and their bad side. It's the good side that they normally show to the world and then it's the bad side to the person that they are behind closed doors. And Eddie used this comparison to describe how he feels about himself when he's sober versus when when he's drunk. When he's sober, he's happy and nice and everyone loves him, he's fun. But whenever he's drunk, he just turns into this evil, destructive, violent monster. He also likened it to a werewolf. You know, like how during the day they're like just an, a normal wolf and then the moon comes out and then they turn into this beast. That's how he described himself. And as they were having these conversations, Gallo just really didn't, like he didn't know what to think. This was his friend. His, his best friend, Eddie Leonski, confiding in him that he is a double murderer. He'd been his friend for years and years and years. Eddie had saved him from being bullied, from being robbed. He'd saved his reputation in the army. Gallo owed a lot to Leonski. You know, Eddie completely changed Gallo's life. But now he's hearing that the same guy's a murderer and his, his morals are conflicted. He wanted to stick by his friend and keep this secret. But at the same time, he, he really wanted to do what was right. He really wanted to give up this information. But Gallo just kind of suppressed all of this and he was like, it's not my business. I'm gonna let Eddie do what he's gonna do. But as the days went by, it was kind of eating away at Gallo. And so he went over to Leon and he said, look, I'm gonna give you one more chance. You've got to give yourself in or I am gonna have to because this is ruining my mind. And Leonski just looked at Gallo and said, do it, do it. This is what I mean by, I think it was really eating away at Eddie Leonski. Like when he was sober, he felt guilty for what he did when he was drunk, but he also didn't wanna get himself in trouble. He didn't wanna have the consequences of his actions. He couldn't bring himself to go and tell the police but if someone else was to do it, then, you know, fine. He got what was coming to him. But despite this increasing guilt, Eddie Leonski still had a taste for murder. And so three days after his last, 
Eddie went out looking for a third victim. It was May 12th and Eddie Leonski was on another one of his nights out when he saw a woman getting off the tram at the tram stop and so he walked over to her. He struck up a conversation with this woman by asking if she had a cigarette lighter. She didn't, but Eddie kept the conversation going anyway. This woman introduced herself as Kathleen Elliott. She said that she'd been at work all day, she'd just got the tram home from work, and now she just had a few more blocks to walk until she got home. So Eddie asked Kathleen if he could walk her home. Bear in mind this is a stranger asking to follow this woman home, but for some reason she said yes, and so the two of them set off walking. It didn't take them long to get there, and when they did, Kathleen stopped outside, she thanked Eddie for walking her there, and then she said goodbye and turned to walk up to her house. And Eddie got a little bit mad about this. He turned to Kathleen, who was walking away, and he said, what, you're not gonna let me in? And she turned to him and she said, well, I'm married and my husband's home, so... No. And a wave of rage came over Eddie Leonski and he ran over to Kathleen and did the exact same thing that he did to all the other women. He grabbed her throat and squeezed as tightly as he possibly could. Luckily for Kathleen, she actually managed to wriggle herself out of Eddie's grasp and scream for help. And Eddie, knowing that they were literally on a residential street where there were a lot of houses, a lot of apartments, he knew that someone would have just heard Kathleen's screams and so he ran. He'd left his first surviving victim and obviously this did not satisfy that urge that Eddie Leonski had developed, that, that taste for murder. And again, Kathleen never reported this incident to the police, which I think is such a shame. It's such a shame that none of these women were doing that. There's obviously a reason that they weren't, probably because they didn't feel like they were gonna be listened to or they felt like the police had enough on their hands with the war and everything. She knew that police were looking for an American soldier in relation to two murders. And she knew that she'd just been attacked by an American soldier. So had she gone forward to the police, she could have caught him so easily, but she didn't. When Leonski ran away from the scene, he ran as far as he possibly could away from Kathleen, but he decided not to go home just yet. He wasn't done. I mean, he tried to murder someone and was unsuccessful, so he was gonna try again. He ran and ran and ran for like 20 minutes. And finally, when he was confident enough that he was far enough away from Kathleen, he set about looking for his next victim. He spotted a woman in the window of a house that was right next to him, and it didn't seem as though there was anyone else in the house. So Leonski walked up and knocked on the door. The woman came and answered the door, and before either of them could say a single word, Eddie Leonski launched forward, wrapped his hands around this woman's neck and began choking her. But once again, this woman managed to wriggle free and run away. Eddie Leonski had left two survivors in one night. In one hour, he had tried to commit murder twice and failed twice. After this, Eddie decided to just call it a day and just carry on drinking instead. It's scary how casual murder was for him. It was like, oh well, never mind, off back to the pub. After this, Eddie waited a few days. I think his confidence really took a knock after being overpowered by two women in a row. This was a guy that's supposed to be this big hench bodybuilder. He's been showing off about his physique all his life. And now what? He's been overpowered by two women in one hour. So over the next few days, he was really trying to build his confidence back up and his muscles. But his next opportunity to kill would present itself in nine days time on May 18th, when Eddie Leonski was out drinking with some friends. While they were out, one of his friends suggested that they all go to the theater to watch a movie. And Eddie was like, yeah, I'm up for it, but I'm really tired. Like, I don't wanna go unless I can have a nap first. So the group all went back to one of their houses where Eddie was supposed to have a nap, but instead he decided to do arguably the complete opposite of have a nap and he went for a walk instead. And it was on this walk that Eddie Leonski bumped into Gladys Hosking. Literally bumped into her, like knocked her over. All the stuff in her hands went all over the floor and it was raining as well. So he'd like ruined her new newspaper and stuff. And he was really apologetic. Who knows, he might've done this on purpose so that he could start a conversation with Gladys. He actually felt so bad that he offered to walk Gladys Hosking the whole way home and hold her umbrella for her. 
said that she wouldn't get wet. He even offered to buy her another newspaper since he ruined the last one. Gladys accepted and so the two of them started walking, they were talking until they reached Eddie's camp because his army camp was actually on the way to Gladys's house. So they passed Camp Pell. And I think Eddie pointed out that that's where he lived. And so Gladys was like, oh, well, leave me here. I can walk the rest of the way home. It was nice of you to even walk me this far. Eddie insisted that he would walk her the whole way home, but Gladys was like, no, honestly, I'm fine, I'm fine. And so she turned and walked by herself. But Eddie didn't want Gladys to leave. He knew he had to do something. He'd loved listening to Gladys talk the whole time they'd been walking. She had one of those beautiful, soft voices that he loved so much and he couldn't let her leave. He launched himself at Gladys Hosking and wrapped his hands around her neck and squeezed as tight as he humanly possibly could. He was not gonna let this one get away just like the last two had. He stayed there staring at how tight his hands were gripping her neck until eventually her body went limp in his arms and he had secured his third kill. He was officially a serial killer now. But as soon as he dropped her body to the ground, reality set in that he had just committed murder right outside his army camp. Arguably the worst and most dangerous place he could have done this. Leonski knew that he had to act quick now. And so he grabbed Gladys's body and just dragged her and dragged her and dragged her all the way into the fields behind his army camp. He was like dragging her under wire fences. He was throwing her over different gates and stuff. Like they were going on some mad expedition because he could not let anyone see this. And it was as Leonski was moving Gladys, like dragging her along these fields, that he heard that she was making noises. Gladys was still alive. So Leonski grabbed the bottom of her dress and started stuffing it in Gladys's mouth so that she would then suffocate on her own dress as he was dragging her to where he was gonna leave her body. He dragged her as far out as he could be bothered to do. And then he decided to stage the body just as he had with the last ones. Although this time it was slightly different because he'd been dragging Gladys the whole way here. She was full of mud. And so he didn't want to mess around too much. So instead he just left her laying face down in the grass, but he decided to pull her dress all the way up exposing her bottom half. He left Gladys's body there in that field and then Leonski started running home, but because it was dark, it was the middle of the night and he was very, very drunk, he had no idea where he was. He eventually bumped into one of the people that worked at his camp and so he asked them for directions. He eventually made his way back to Camp Pell and then he passed out drunk on his bed, naked at like 9 p.m. The next morning, Gladys Hosking's body was found by a butcher who was delivering meat in the area. And as soon as Gallo heard this news that a young woman's body had been found out back of their camp, he knew it had to be Leonski. Gallo raced straight to Eddie's room and he said, look, it was you, wasn't it? You've done it again. Eddie denied it, but Gallo just knew it was him. It was no one else. A few days later, so obviously at this point in the case, the police have zeroed in on Camp Pell because Gladys was killed literally just outside. So police know their killer is in that camp. So they're calling up all the men for interviews and for lineups. They've got all the witnesses there to be able to look at all the men. And on this particular day, Eddie and Gallo were both called up for interviews. As they walked down to the place where all the police were, Eddie turned to Gallo and said, well, looks like this is the end of the trail for me. But Eddie didn't want to get caught, obviously. No serial killer ever does. And so he gave it one last chance at getting away with his crimes. So Eddie and Gallo are walking to where the police are putting on this lineup. And the two of them are walking next to each other. They walk all the way up. Gallo gets there and he stops by the police, but Eddie just <laughs> keeps going. He just keeps walking and walking and walking. He got all the way to the end of camp and he turned round to Gallo and he had this relieved look on his face. And then he turned back around and just carried on out of the camp. He'd gotten away with it again. He'd somehow avoided detection again. But after this incident, Gallo decided enough was enough. He himself couldn't handle knowing about this. So he decided to go and snitch on Eddie Leonski because obviously Eddie wasn't gonna go to the police himself, so Gallo was. In May of 1942, Gallo called his higher ups and all the police into an office and sat and told them 
everything that Eddie Leonsky had ever said to him about the murders. And when all the men left that room, it turns out that Eddie Leonsky had already been arrested anyway. As he'd just been walking through camp, one of the witnesses had seen him and recognized him as the killer. And so they shouted to the police to go and arrest him. And they did. And during my research for this case, I found a really interesting comment from the officer that handcuffed and arrested Leonsky. He said that Eddie Leonsky had the biggest wrists he'd ever seen. Big wrists. He actually had trouble getting the handcuffs on his wrist because his wrists were just really thick. I mean, he is a bodybuilder. Oh, but can you do... Can you do exercises to make your wrists bigger? I don't think so. Anyway, they arrested Eddie Leonsky and brought him in for a questioning. And while they did, another team of police officers went over to his bunk to go and search it. And when they did, one of the first things they noticed about Eddie Leonsky's bunk was that all over, like all over the floor, all over his bed, all over his clothes, his shoes, everything, was that same yellow tan-ish clay that was found at the scene of Gladys Hoskins' murder. That same substance that was literally inserted inside of her by her killer was all over Eddie's bedroom. So police conducting the search of his bunk relayed this information to the police conducting the interview of Eddie. And so this interview very quickly became an interrogation. They were pretty sure that they had the right guy now. Police immediately presented him with this piece of information and they said, well, if you're not the killer, tell us how all of this clay got all over all your stuff. And Eddie kind of tried to play it dumb and he was like, well, I go for walks in that field sometimes. Yeah, but that's not enough to get the clay all over your room. Police knew they weren't really gonna get anywhere with that. And so instead they decided to start confronting Eddie Leonsky with every single piece of evidence that they had against him. They started off with the fact that his best friend literally gave him in because that's the biggest piece of evidence they have. There was also the fact that Eddie Leonsky had actually been seen by someone that worked at Camp Pell on the night that he committed Gladys Hosking's murder. Remember I said he stumbled around and couldn't find his way back, so then he went and asked someone for directions. Well, it turned out this person that he'd asked for directions worked at Camp Pell and he'd obviously seen Eddie Leonsky that night that he murdered Gladys covered in that clay stuff. And this guy also said that Eddie was speaking in a very high pitched voice. He seemed very distressed actually, let's start with that. He was crying, he was a mess, he was very, very emotional. And he was talking in this very high pitched woman's voice. It was clear that he was probably trying to self-soothe. He was very panicky after he'd just committed his third murder. And so now he's trying to comfort himself with his woman's voice that he put on. So anyway, there was all this evidence. He'd been seen after committing the murder. His, he'd literally told his friend that he'd committed murders. So police presented all of this information and they were very interested as to how Eddie would react once he was presented with all of this because it was very clear that they were onto him Onto him is an understatement, they had him. But Leonsky was quite defensive through this whole interrogation and not in an aggressive way, not in a like, it's not me way. He was very calm. He would just try and calmly explain things away. Like, oh, I was covered in mud that night because I'd gone out for a walk and I was drunk and I fell over and I just fell in the mud. He tried to explain Gallo snitching on him by saying that Anthony Gallo was simple. He said that Gallo was very gullible. He believed literally anything you told him, even jokes. And so Eddie Leonsky's newest joke was that he was a serial killer and he was gonna see if Gallo could really believe it or was he gonna finally realize that Eddie was having him on because that was his most daring joke yet, apparently. And as for the clay being all over his bed, he said that was from when he fell over in the field he was covered in the clay, he went back home and because he was very drunk, he just passed out and never cleaned up after himself. And I hate to say it, but some of those explanations are pretty good. Not the Anthony Gallo one, but like him falling over in a field and getting covered in mud because he was drunk and then that's why he was crying and that's why he needed directions back. It kind of makes sense. We know it's not true, but like it kind of makes sense. So investigators knew that they were gonna have to try some other methods to get this information out of Eddie because he was just way too calm. He had an answer for everything. They weren't outsmarting him yet. They wanted to try and catch him off guard or maybe like manipulate his emotions. If we could get him really emotional, then maybe he would crack. So for that reason, they decided to take Eddie Leonsky out for a day trip to the site of Gladys Hosking's murder. 
I mean, it was just outside the camp, but still, they wanted to see if being there would spark any emotion in him, any fear, any guilt, any remorse, but he did nothing. <laughs> it didn't affect him at all. He literally just stood there staring. So police realized at this point, it was very unlikely that they were gonna get a confession from Eddie Leonsky. They'd tried pretty much everything. They confronted him with all the evidence. They tried to get his emotions out. None of it was working. So instead, without a confession, they knew that they were just gonna have to do things the old fashioned way and get evidence against him. They put him in police lineups where he was picked out by every single witness, obviously. All of them recognized him as the person that they'd seen at the scene of the murder or with the victim. They continued searches of his bunker, like they were looking through all his drawers and stuff now, and they found two newspapers in there. They were both open on very particular pages. One of them was open on the page of Pauline Thompson's murder, and one of them was still open on an article about Ivy McLeod's murder. And Eddie Leonsky was not the type to normally buy the newspaper. He was not a newspaper reader. He wouldn't buy it every day. He only bought them around this time so that he could read about his own murders. And what a coincidence it was that he had two newspapers in his whole room and they were both open on pages about the murders that he was suspected of. And eventually now, police felt as though they had enough evidence against Eddie Leonsky to formally charge him with the three murders on May 22nd, 1942. And it was finally then when he was in custody, it wasn't looking good for him, he was definitely getting done for these murders, that Eddie Leonsky finally decided to confess. Once he'd given his confession, police asked him, why? Why did you do this? Why did you murder these three women? What did you get out of it? What was the motive? And Eddie Leonsky replied saying that he just really loved their voices. Anytime he heard the women speaking or singing, he just grew so obsessed with their voices. Like I said, this was something that he dealt with his whole life. It, I don't think it had been a fetish his whole life in adulthood maybe, because he was only 24 actually at the time of these murders, but as a child, this had been his biggest comfort in times of extreme stress. And let's be honest, he was in the war right now, which is a time of extreme stress. So he was looking for these feminine voices to comfort him, but because it was mixed with a fetish and because he was very drunk and violent and he was just this way predisposed, this is how it manifested. Eddie Leonsky told the police that once he'd heard these women's beautiful voices, he didn't wanna lose them. He didn't want them to go and take their voices with them. He wanted to keep those voices. And his way of keeping those voices was to kill the women. He particularly said about Pauline Thompson, his second victim, the woman that he met in a bar and she sang as they walked home. He said that her voice was sweet and soft and I could feel myself going mad over it. And this is actually why Eddie Leonsky has been nicknamed the Of Mice and Men killer because they're comparing him to Lenny Small from Of Mice and Men. Lenny Small is a character who is big, he's very strong, he doesn't really know his strength and he just really likes nice, soft, cute little things. But because he is so big and strong, he often ends up ruining these things for himself. He has a misunderstanding of how fragile these small things are. So like in the book, he has this pet mouse that he keeps in his pocket so that he can stroke it and feel how soft it is. But he actually ends up crushing it to death in his pocket because he's just too, big and strong and he doesn't know his strength. Of course, there are a lot of differences between Eddie Leonsky and Lenny from Of Mice and Men. Lenny did all those things by accident. He wasn't, you know, a serial killer. Oh wait, he did kill Curly's wife. The way I just never even realized that through my research, he did kill Curly's wife, didn't he? Anyway, there's a lot of similar traits between Leonsky and Lenny Small in that they just want these comforting little soft things, but then they turn into a monster when they try to get them. About his first murder victim, Ivy McLeod, Eddie Leonsky has said, she had a lovely voice. I wanted that voice. I grabbed her around the neck. I choked her. I choked her. Then about Pauline Thompson, he said, she told me I had a baby face, but I was wicked underneath. She was singing in my ear and looked in my eyes. It sounded as if she was singing for me. She had a nice voice. We turned a corner. There was nobody around. I just heard her voice. I grabbed her and told her to keep on singing. I choked her. How could she keep on singing? I grabbed her. I grabbed her. I don't know why. I grabbed her around the neck. She stopped singing and she fell down. 
I got mad then and tore at her. I tore her apart. And the tearing that he's talking about, I believe references to her dress, not her. Like he was ripping up her dress. And about his final murder victim, Gladys Hosking, Leonski has said, she smiled and stepped back. I seemed to step with her. I had my arm around her neck. I changed the position of my hands so that my thumbs were at her throat and I choked her. It was very clear that these women's voices were a huge factor in the murders. Maybe not their individual voice, but just simply the fact that they were a woman with a high-pitched voice. And it was simply the fact that they happened to see and speak to Eddie Leonsky that made them victims. So now Eddie has confessed, he's charged with the murders and he's being held in a holding cell until his trial date. And in this holding cell, Eddie Leonsky made headlines for acting like, for acting like Eddie Leonsky to be fair. He would walk around on his hands in his cell for like, 20 minutes every day. That was how he would get his daily exercise is what he called it. That means he probably walked on his hands about a mile every day, just around his cell. And obviously all the newspapers were like, what the hell is this serial killer doing? So it was like front page headlines. Like he was overtaking the war in terms of headlines. Serial killer does handstands in cell. But that wasn't all he would do. He would do crossword puzzles and even play drafts with the prison guards to keep his mind active. That was one thing he was very adamant about while he was in this holding cell. He wasn't gonna get lazy on any front, whether that was his physical health or his mental health, his like, psychological duh, 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 duh. he was keeping everything healthy he was working his brain he was working his physical body even though he was locked in this tiny room so eventually the time came for his trial in november of 1942 so the same year that he committed all of these murders and this trial is quite controversial for a, for a couple of reasons so a lot of people believe that eddie leonsky at the time of the murders was mentally ill he was mentally unwell because, I mean, there's a few things that point towards that conclusion. He would cry and console himself in this woman's voice. He would sing to himself, he would talk in this high-pitched voice. It seemed as though there was something potentially wrong. It begs the question, was this man of a sound mind when he committed the murders? Or would he be found clinically insane? So Eddie Leonsky was seen by about three psychiatrists before his trial, just to make sure if he was mentally ill or not. And every single one of them said that he wasn't. They found nothing in their assessments. But this was the 1940s and people now especially believe that had he been assessed by a doctor in 2021, then he would have definitely been diagnosed with something. So a lot of people believe that he was mentally ill and it just wasn't picked up on at the time. And so then his trial went unfairly because he wasn't given that plea, that insanity plea. But this wasn't the only controversy about this trial. A lot of people had an issue that American soldier, Eddie Leonsky, committed three murders in Australia of Australian women in an Australian jurisdiction in their country under their laws, but somehow he was still tried by an American court-martial under American military law. I think this was the first time that this had ever happened, that an outsider had committed a crime in Australia, but was tried by the laws of their home country. So a lot of people had a lot to say about that. But anyway, let's just start talking about his trial. So throughout the whole court proceedings, it was noted that Eddie Leonsky was rather upbeat. He was very smiley, very jokey, very positive. Again, it almost seems as though he could be mentally ill because maybe he doesn't quite realize what is facing him. You could say that it's just him being a horrible, evil, twisted serial killer. A lot of them do smile and laugh in court because they wanna seem like they don't care about what they've done. But also, as you'll see later on in this case, Eddie Leonsky, I personally think, used humor to cope with things that scared him. Well, when he was sober, at least. When he was sober, I think he used humor, and then when he was drunk, I think he used this woman's voice that he would put on. But maybe that is the same thing. Maybe he is just trying to like comfort the blow for himself by being by telling jokes in court. Again, when he was in court, Leonsky was asked why he did it. He was asked once by the police and once in court. And now that he was in court, he gave a slightly different answer. He was asked and he literally just stood there, shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't know. But later, as the whole proceedings were going on, someone said something to him and then he replied with, 
And that's why I choked those ladies. It was to get to their voices. Actually, just now thinking of it, maybe that is why he chose the murder method that he did. He's literally grabbing their throat where they sing from. That's interesting. I hadn't even thought about that. Eddie Leonsky's team, his defense, desperately tried to argue that even though his psychiatric assessments came back to say that he was not mentally ill, they were desperately trying to argue that he was and that it was just not picked up on in these assessments. So for example, they got up his whole family history. His mother was in a psychiatric unit at one point. So was his brother. They were trying to say that he must have some kind of genetic mental illness or disorder. And some members of the jury did believe them. Three out of the 12 jurors, so that's one in four jurors, was actually for this. They actually believed that he was mentally ill and that he shouldn't be tried at full capacity like this. But that wasn't enough to save him. And with a majority verdict, Eddie Leonsky was found guilty of all three murders. So now came his sentencing. He is officially guilty and now they need to decide how much prison time he is gonna be facing. But his team already knew what was gonna happen. And Eddie himself knew what they were about to say. And so before they read out his sentence, he turned to his lawyer and asked if he could hold his hand. And the lawyer said yes. So these two men stood there holding hands as the judge read out that Eddie Leonsky would be sentenced to death. He was to be executed, hanged in the gallows in November of that same year. Leonsky was asked if he had anything to say to this verdict in court and he replied, I've been wanting experience and this will be a new experience for me. Don't worry about me. I've been ready to die since I was 16. There'll be plenty of experiences, I suppose, on the other side. It's believed that Eddie Leonsky was actually only given the death penalty because of the state of the world at that time, because of the war. This is another controversy, actually. A lot of people believe that he shouldn't have been sentenced to death. What you believe on that is completely up to you, but I'll explain why people believe that he shouldn't have been. They believe that he was only sentenced to death because America had sent over all these soldiers to help Australia. They were being the good guys. They were doing them a favor. But in the meantime, they had sent one over and he was killing off all the women over there. This looked so bad for America. This was so bad for America and Australia's friendship. <laughs> That's definitely not the word to use. Their, their relationship, their alliance. And it was actually down to Eddie Leonsky's boss, like his big military boss that was like in charge of all the American men in Australia. It was down to him, an American man, whether the death penalty would be offered to Eddie Leonsky. And this guy just wanted to save the relationship with Australia. If he would have said, no, don't put him up for the death penalty, all the Australians would be like, that's horrific. He's killed three of our people and now you wanna save his life. It'd make the relationship between Australia and America even worse. So this guy was just like, yeah, put him up for the death penalty, whatever, anything to save our relationship. So a lot of people refer to this as Eddie being sacrificed for the sake of, of these countries' relationship with each other. People that believe this are also the same people that believe he was mentally ill, by the way. Not that like he's a cold-hearted murderer and he like should have been let off the death penalty. It's the people that believe he wasn't in a sound mind at the time of the murders believe he shouldn't then be executed for said murders, you know? If he would have been diagnosed with something in his assessments, then I think he would have just got life in prison rather than execution. And it didn't help that around the time of Eddie's sentencing, there'd been another incident in Australia where an American soldier had shot and killed an Australian soldier in a bar. So this was now a lot of murders that American soldiers were causing over in Australia. And so I think that really influenced this guy's decision to put Eddie up for the death penalty. Anyway, Eddie Leonsky was sent back to his holding cell where he was now gonna wait until his execution date. And he really didn't have much to do in there. Actually, in the meantime, he converted to Catholicism he became a Catholic. You see this kind of semi-often with death row inmates or people that, just people in general that know they're gonna die soon. A lot of them, they're very aware that their death is getting closer day by day and they don't know what's on the other side. They don't know what to expect and it causes a lot of anxiety. And so a lot of people in their final moments, they turn to religion for a comfort because of course, 
Catholicism, Christianity as a whole, their belief is that if you're a good person, you'll go to heaven. I don't know what Eddie thought he was. Maybe being into Catholicism and maybe confessing his sins gave him some hope that there would be something nice for him on the other side when he was executed. On the night before Eddie was due to be hanged, he had a visitor come to his cell. It was one of the investigators that had been working on his case to arrest this guy. His name was Detective Sid McGuffey and the two of them had actually become friends. Even though they were like working against each other, Eddie was trying to get away with his crime, this guy was trying to get him put down for his crime. After he'd finally confessed and stuff, the two of them spent more time together and they actually got on quite well, they became friends. It was McGuffey that Leonsky kind of broke down to and told all the reasonings for the murders. You know, how like he loved the women's voices, they made him feel comforted, things like that. He was the one that Leonsky confided in. So McGuffey had come to his cell to say his final goodbyes to Leonsky before he was hanged. And Leonsky turned to him and said, well, so long, Mr. McGuffey. If you've got any more dames you want choking, just bring them along and I'll fix them for you. This is what I was saying earlier about how he used humor, even horrible dark humor about his own victims. He used it to deal with stressful times in his life, like the fact that he was literally gonna die tomorrow. There was another instance where he'd been smoking a cigarette, I think a few days before his execution, he'd just been chilling there with the prison guards, and then he put this cigarette out, and he made this comment about how he was gonna quit smoking because he wanted to help his health and live longer. He would say stuff to people like, why do you look so sad? I'm the one who's gonna get his neck pulled. He also really liked referring to his future hanging as a facelift as well. And this is what I mean by how I think he just uses this dark humor as a coping mechanism because most of the jokes he would tell were about himself, but then he would do it about his victims. On November 9th, 1942, Eddie Leonsky woke up on the day of his death and prepared to be hanged. He said goodbye to all of the guards, all of the prison staff that he'd made friends with over the last few months while he'd been there. Actually, I think it's important to note that a lot of the staff that worked at this prison really liked Eddie Leonsky. This is a serial killer that is being held in their jail before his death date, but they all keep like nipping down to his cell to go and have a conversation with him or play games with him. They thought he was funny. I think it's so crazy because you'd never hear of anything like that happening now. If there was a serial killer in 2021 and all the police in the prison made friends with him, that'd be cancel worthy. But anyway, as Eddie Leonsky left to go to the gallows, he was waving to all these guards saying, thank you for everything they've done for him for the past few months, for being great friends with him. He turned to them and said, I won't forget what you guys did for me. I won't forget but I won't have very long to remember, will I? It's another one of those jokes. On the way to the gallows, he was singing this song to himself. I don't know if this was in a high-pitched voice. We can presume it probably was. And this song was called, It's a Lovely Day Tomorrow. Eddie Leonsky arrived at the gallows at 6 a.m. It was literally just him and the executioner in the room. There was no one else there to witness his death. As the executioner started putting the black hood over Eddie Leonsky's head, he leaned into him and just said, I'm sorry, but Eddie replied to him, it's okay, carry on. He put the noose over Eddie's head, led him to the trap door and then dropped it. And Eddie Leonsky dropped to his death at the age of 24 years old. It's believed that Leonsky died almost instantly from his neck snapping. A lot of people that are executed, they, they stay there hanging for like 15 minutes as they just suffocate. But Eddie got lucky in that respect, I suppose. His body was initially buried in Australia, but then it was later dug up and transported back to America because I think they made this big like mass grave for everyone that died in the war in Hawaii. So now he's buried in Hawaii alongside a bunch of other soldiers that lost their lives at war. But that is all I have for this video. Thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up down below because that would really help me out. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Remember, if you do want to get a huge discount off of a two year plan, plus a bonus gift, you can go through my link, which is nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor and use the code Eleanor at checkout. Huge thank you to all of my channel members for helping me decide the cases that I cover, especially my tier two members whose names 
options are all on screen right now. If you want to become a channel member, you can just click the join button on a desktop or there'll be a link in the description of this video. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up down below because that would really help me out. If you want to subscribe, you can click this link to do so right here. If you want to subscribe to my second channel, you can click this link right here. And if you want to watch another true crime video, there'll be a playlist on screen right now. Bye.